All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So we're in the book of Hebrews. Been here for a little while. We're in chapter 9 today. So uh, chapter 7, Pastor Chris got into some really deep waters, talking about uh, uh, you know, some really heavy stuff. And, and in chapter 8, I loved how that, that chapter started. The author says, here's the main point. <laughs> So he basically says, I know I've confused you for the last three chapters. Here's basically what I'm saying. And then he's kind of continuing that point as we get into chapter 9. In chapter 8, in Hebrews, we saw the comparison between Jesus' ministry and the high, um, as high priests in heaven and earthly high priests and how they uh, served in the tabernacle. Uh, and the earthly tabernacle, we talked about this a little bit last week, was, is a copy or a shadow um, of the temple in heaven. And so that's something to keep in mind. Anytime you read the Old Testament, is, is the, God primarily used the Old Testament. To, he used physical things in real people's lives to teach us about spiritual concepts and truths that later in the New Testament he kind of clarified for us. And so the tabernacle was one of those things. And so last week we talked about how you know, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, uh, under the priests and, and all of that stuff, was, was inferior to this new covenant uh, that Jesus ushered in. That Jesus is better right, than whatever it is that we're tempted to turn back to. Jesus is better. And I always like to remind people, that Hebrews, uh, is, it's, it's an interesting book. It was written by a Hebrew, two Hebrews, to encourage them to quit being Hebrew. Okay? Because that's what was going on. Is they were, these were Hebrew people who became Christians. And remember, they didn't have a completed canon of Scripture. They didn't have the New Testament that they could refer to. There were, there were a lot of questions in the early days of the church. And so people were challenging them on their faith. And, and they were like, well how do you offer sacrifices? And you guys don't even have a temple. And, you know, what is the deal with this Christianity thing? So that's part of what this letter was written for. Um, And so the difference between the old way and the new way is still in focus as we read in chapter 9. All that being said, let's pray and we'll get into it, all right? Uh, God, we thank you this morning for giving us another opportunity to fellowship, to uh, to sing songs of praise, to worship. All of those are our are, are privileges that we have living in this place in this time that you chose to put us in. God, we know we have brothers and sisters around the world today who have to, have to meet together in, privately or in fear of real persecution. So God, we're, uh, we pray for them, but also we're thankful that you put us where we are and when we are. Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand your word today. And as we get into some of the deeper waters, we pray that we don't get lost in it, but that we are drawn closer to you through it. Lord, let us leave here today knowing you better and being closer to you than when we arrived. We know this is only possible through you and your spirit, and we pray your will will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. It says, so now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. So there were ways we did things, right? Verse 2, for there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Or your Bible may say the sanctuary. Uh, Behind the second veil was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies. Having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables uh, of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. So remember, this is a Hebrew author writing to Hebrew people, 
And he's basically assuming, you guys already know about the tabernacle, and we don't have time to talk about that. Well, he didn't have time. I'm going to take a little time to talk about it. Um, but, you know, he's, he's referring to some things that he's, you know, kind of taking for granted that the, that the audience would know. And we talked about this a little bit last week. Now, we're, uh, even though he says we don't have time to now speak in detail, we're going to get into a little bit of detail. But literally, you could spend weeks and weeks digging into the, all the majestic truths that are hidden in, in how God designed the tabernacle and what everything represents. When Moses was given the instructions uh, for the tab- tabernacle, God told him uh, that, you know, this is, you know, pay really close attention because what you're doing is, is a type of what you, you, you see in heaven, right? You'll never recreate what I have, but it, you'll get the basic idea is, is what we hope for. And so part of what he told him to do was, first of all, to design a courtyard to be cordoned off with white linen. Okay, so the tabernacle was just a tent. But outside of that tent would be a, ta- would be a courtyard that was kind of walled off uh, with white linen. It was going to be 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. So to put that pers- in, in perspective, so it's about the size of this room, but twice as long. That's the courtyard where everyone could gather. Now, remember, Moses is leading about three million people through the wilderness. And God's like, we're going to build a place where you can all worship. I want you to make it 150 feet long. It's almost like God knew that not everyone was going to be coming to meet with him. Not everyone was going to come, and definitely not all at once. The Bible tells us that the gate is small and the way is narrow, right? that leads to life, and there are few who find it. He knew that not everyone was going to come to the temple or the tabernacle, But he made a space for those who do. And in the courtyard, like I said, this is where you came to to wait on the sacrifices. It's where you came to celebrate deliverance and all that. In the courtyard, there was this brass altar where the sacrifices were offered. And there's a big basin where the priests would wash. They would go through a ceremonial cleansing before they offered the sacrifices. So that's in full view of anybody who would come. And like I said, the tabernacle, it's just just a tent. It's a fancy word for a tent. And even though the courtyard, we say that's small, right? It's 150 feet long. uh, But the tabernacle itself was 45 feet long, 15 feet high. So that's a little lower than, than this ceiling. And 15 feet wide. It's about the width of that row of chairs right here. So length and width, it's roughly the size of this section of our seating. That's where God would meet with with man. Inside that tent, there were two rooms, we'll call them that. The first area you, you would enter into was called the holy place. And it was 30 feet long, still 15 feet high and 15 feet wide. It's not the TARDIS. It's not bigger on the inside than on the outside, right? Um, But, you know, two-thirds of the, the length of this thing was this first room, the holy place. And inside that, that holy place, you'd walk in, and there's the, a table to your right, the, for the, it's the table of showbread, and there would be 12 loaves of bread on that table, rep- representing God's desire to fellowship and break bread with us, to be close to us. 
To the left, there's this golden lampstand. It's a, like a menorah. It's a candlestick, whatever you want to call it. It's a thing uh, that had oil, and you know, there's, it's the source of light. And then straight ahead was the altar of incense. And, uh, and it's sitting in front of the veil. There's another piece of cloth there, right? And on the other side of that is another space. But this altar of incense is sitting there. And then behind that veil is that second room that we call, anybody? The Holy of Holies. And so, I'm not great at math, but based on what we said earlier, that means this space is 15 by 15. So it's a little shorter than the width of this little platform I'm on and back to that little wall there. It's a tight space. Some of you have bedrooms bigger than that. Only one person entered this room. In the end, when we get past all the chaos in life, right, out in the wilderness, and we come into the courtyard, that's the place where the people gather to worship. And we go into the place where the worship becomes a little bit more intimate. And then we get to this small, quiet, still place where no one is around. And it's just me and God. That's the Holy of Holies. This, this space, it housed the Ark of the Covenant, which is a fancy way of saying it was a box. There were a couple of uh, like staffs that they put through rings on the thing so they could carry it without touching it. And, uh, you know, if you ever saw Indiana Jones, you know, it's bad news to touch that thing, right? <laughs> it's not entirely a scripturally accurate, but... <laughs> There's some good stuff in there. Anyway, uh, so, you know, this box um, was just a wooden box, but the lid uh, was made of gold. Inside that box, there's a, there was a jar of manna, right? That's the bread that God fed the Israelites with in the wilderness. Aaron, Aaron's rod is in there. And then these two tablets containing the Ten Commandments. The lid of that box we call the mercy seat. And it was covered in gold. It had two uh, cherubim, you know, which are angels. We first see them in the Garden of Eden. They're the ones that, uh, you know, after Adam and Eve are kicked out, they guard the, the entrance with a flaming sword. They're like, uh-uh, you're not, you're not let back in here. So there's angels on this thing. And the mercy seat, there over the mercy seat, is where God, the Shekinah glory of God, the, the visible presence of God, the um, kavod is another word for it, right? It's the, the glory, the weight, the substance of God would appear and talk with man. Now, there's a little problem in those first few verses we read. Uh, in verse 3 and 4, it talks about that altar of incense I mentioned, right? Uh, and it says, behind the second veil, uh, there was a tabernacle, or wait, yeah, uh, a golden altar of incense. Um, it's a little confusing how the author places the altar. He says it's behind the veil in the Holy of Holies. Now, if you, go back, if you go back and look at when God first gave the instructions for the tabernacle, he says it was supposed to be on the other side. It was supposed to be on the front side of the veil. Now, it could be a linguistic thing, right? Because it basically the language there is, is it just says there's this altar belonging to, 
the veil. It's part of the veil, right? If you set one up, you set up the other. Um, and that could be, it could be just a, a linguistic thing. But I think there's a good chance that somewhere along the way, the altar got moved. Because they tore this thing down and they set it back up. And they tore it down and they set it up. And they trained people to do it. And when they retired, new people did it. And somewhere along the way, I think maybe somebody set this altar up on the wrong side. And the next guy said, well, that's where it was, so that's where it goes. And I've seen that in my workplace. I've seen it here in the church where people were like, well, this is where this goes. And I'm like, it only goes there because I set it there one time six years ago. And everyone just went, well, I guess that's where it goes now. Right? The reason I point that out is it encourages me a little bit. Because even when we, even when we mess up the furniture, God still gets through and does what he does. Even when we get things a little out of order. You know, here, uh, we want to follow God's pattern that he's shown us in his word. And we, we're trying our best to follow that. Um, but in this church, and in my home, and even in my own heart, we get things out of order sometimes. More often than we want to admit. And the grace of God covers over it, and he still does what he does. You know, there are, uh, there are some churches that have... Um, you know, robes and pointy hats, which is interesting to me. Uh, some, some churches have no music, and they're adamant about it, that that's the way it is. Uh, some have long-haired guys with tattoos allowed to talk to people <laughs> from the platform. But somehow, in all of those churches, God cuts through the chaos and through the veil, and he still changes hearts. And that is encouraging to me. I think he honors it when we do our best to, to follow the pattern. But he's not going to be hindered by us. Anyway, so we'll read on here. Verse 6 says, Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. So that first room, right? There, there's always something going on there. But into the second that smaller, quiet, still space, only the high priest enters once a year. One time a year. Not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. So known sin, like if you know you did something wrong, in, under the Old Covenant, there were all sorts of different sacrifices and practices that, it's funny, as God would give the law, you know, do not do this. Now when you do this, here's what I want you to do. Because he, knew, he knows us, right? But if you had known sin, you dealt with that quickly. But there was a day where unknown sin, that sins committed in ignorance had to be dealt with. Now, you know, you may have heard this before, but that ignorance is not a defense when it comes to the law. Is that right? All right. The, the, the police officer and attorney agree. That's how it is. Ignorance of the law is not a defense, unfortunately. Um, we've all done things before where we found out afterwards that, oh my gosh, I didn't know that they took it that way, or that I offended that person, or I didn't mean to lie, I thought I said this, or, right? We've all done it. But all sin has a hefty judgment upon it. So this one day of the year, they would deal with all those sins. Now, the beautiful thing is under the new covenant, Jesus' work is greater because it atoned, he says, for all sin for all time. Jesus didn't just die for the sins you did in your past. But even the sins you're going to do today and in your future, 
Those are not surprises to him. And again, that gives me great encouragement. When I, when I fail and, and, uh, and beating myself up about it, he's like, yeah, I already knew that about you. You're not surprising me. I loved you enough anyway. Verse 8, it says, The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol, or in the Greek, it's a um, parabole, it's a parable, it's a, it's a uh, you know, a sign or a symbol or a, you know, something that is supposed to teach you another truth for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. So there in verses 8 and 9, the author is, is reminding us that all of this stuff was just a symbol. right? It couldn't do everything that God wants to do in your life. While we were under that old system of worship, that system of atonement, there were still barriers between God and us. Because there was only one guy, one day a year, who could enter into that holy place, the holy of holies. God couldn't, under the old system, he couldn't turn to a purified people and say, come close. And fellowship with me. Walk with me like we once did in the garden. It wasn't until that old covenant was done away with and and replaced with a new covenant that we talked about last week. A new way to God, apart from all the rituals and the ceremonies and all of that stuff. Now, we can look down our nose at the old, uh, people in the Old Testament and be like, oh, how foolish. They had all these rules and rituals and ceremonies. But we have ours, right? We gather at a specific day, at a specific time, and we do things a specific way. And we sing songs that most of us know, and if we don't, we just kind of move our mouths and act like we do. And we, you know, we have our, our ceremonies and our rituals. We read words from a special book. But the value isn't in the ritual and the ceremony itself. Right? If those things are not drawing you closer to God and closer into fellowship with Him, then we've fallen into the same trap. Right? But they have a goal, they have a purpose. Right, so make sure we're, when we're participating in those things that that is the goal. I want to be a little closer, a little more intimate. Now, as the author said, the old way, he says, was symbolic. Uh, it should teach us something about what God is after in my life and in yours. So I want to I take you on a little imagination trip here. Imagine that you're, you're a young man from the tribe of Levi. You're a descendant of Aaron, and you're pretty proud of that. As you're growing up, you get to come to the courtyard, and you see your dad working and serving. and You, you see that form of worship modeled for you. And eventually, you get to start doing that, and and as you get a little bit older and more experienced, you, you move up and you start serving in the holy place. You help set up the tent and you help you know, set up all of the elements. And every morning and evening you burn incense on the altar and you keep the oil in the lamp and keep it trimmed and burning. Every Sabbath day you, you change the bread on the table of showbread. And eventually you... You become the high priest. You've moved up to the top spot. 
Now your job is this. You prepare all year long for one day. This day, we call it Yom Kippur. This one day, this day of atonement. You can read about that in Leviticus 16. But you prepare all year for this, and for the week leading up to Yom Kippur, you don't leave the tabernacle or the temple grounds later. And you spend every day rehearsing every movement and every word that's going to happen on that day. Because it's a big deal. And so on, the day arrives, and he would start out by the, the pe- all the people would gather. As many, you know, they would pile into the courtyard as tight as they could. And then everyone else is standing outside of the courtyard trying to lean in and, and see what they can see. And you come out and they would sacrifice a bull to open the thing, to, like as a dedication. And then you would go through a ritual washing in view of everyone. Right? So you take off your fancy robes and you put on the special white linen garments. That sounds fancy. They're basically like underwear, you know. You'd put on some weird, like, I always picture like those old 1900 swimsuits that you see guys in with the like one Andre the Giant strap, you know what I'm talking about? I don't think that's what it was, but that's what I picture. But you'd strip down to these white linen garments and a tunic and a, uh, a belt and a head covering, basically like a turban. You'd wash in that basin And then before anything else happens, we're going to sacrifice another bull. And this bull, this big 1,500-pound animal, is going to die to pay to cover my sin before I go into that tent. They bring out two goats after we've done all that. There's two goats that are brought out. And one would have a scarlet thread tied on it, and that would signify that this is the one that we're going to sacrifice for everyone, for all of those, those sins that we weren't fully aware of. Right? That one's going to die. The other is going to play a different role. We call this one Azazel, or the scapegoat, the goat that escapes is all that means, right? That goat is going to play another role, like I said, in a a minute. But there's two goats, both dealing with different parts of sin. Why is that? Well, sin needs to be forgiven and forgotten. So the high priest, he'd take coals from the fire that we've been burning this meat on and, uh, and, and two handfuls of incense from the altar and in the holy place, and then enter behind the veil into that holy of holies. And he burned incense on the coals from the altar, and the smoke would, would fill that little room, right? It's, it's tight space. It fills the room, and it would cover the altar, and it would cover him. Then he'd come back out, and he'd collect the blood from that bull that he sacrificed a few minutes ago, and then he would go back in, he'd sprinkle it, seven times on the ground and seven times on the, on the mercy seat, on the lid of the ark. And at this point, if he's still alive, because if he's done any of this with impure motives and impure heart, if he really didn't cover his sin, there's a good chance he's going to drop dead. It happened enough that the other priests enacted this practice where they would put bells on his garments and a rope around his foot because you didn't want to enter in there if you're not the high priest. And it happened enough that the guys fell dead in, the, in that room that they were like, you know, we need a way to drag their dead bodies out of there without us going in. So at this point, if you made it this far, you'd come out, And now it's time for that goat with the red thread on it, right? Now we're going to sacrifice that goat. And this is for the the sins of the people. 
Before he goes back into the tent, we grab the other goat. And he put his hand on this goat and proclaim, bear and be gone, right? Bear my sin and get out of here. And they would drive this goat um, out, of the, out of the tent, out of town. And all the people would hoot and holler and jeer at this thing. They're like, yeah, yeah, get out of here. And the poor goat's like, what did I, you know? And then he would take the blood from the other goat that he's just sacrificed and take it back into that room and sprinkle it again. And God would deal with that priest in that moment, in that place. And if everything has gone well, right, all the people, they've been waiting, they've been watching. Hopefully the high priest did everything right. Hopefully he didn't die. Uh, hopefully the sacrifice was done right. And if the priest comes back out, he would proclaim this. He'd raise his hands and say, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. Right? We did it. And everyone would just celebrate and they'd sigh with relief. You know, we're forgiven for another year. That's exhausting. Right? And that was just for the stuff I don't even know that I did. Are you tired? Do you ever get tired trying to do all the things? Hebrews 9, verse 11. says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal Inheritance. We can get into more of that next week. I think Pastor Chris will be here to cover that. But here's the thing. 2,000 years ago, the world unknowingly watched and waited. Was this Jesus, this great high priest, was he who he said he was? Did it work? Right? Is, is our sin paid for or not? And he did the work on the cross, and he, he was wrapped in that white linen we talked about earlier. And the veil was torn, and he came out of the, tra- out of the tomb proclaiming, forgiven. So if you're a Christian, I want you to consider this. Right? Salvation is proclaimed in the courtyard. This is where we all gather, right? It's wonderful, but there is more. God wants you to come a little closer and go a little deeper. In the holy place, like that's the next phase, you can start serving. Someone made the bread for the table. Someone set up the table. Uh, someone set up and tore down, and someone uh, kept the lamps trimmed and burning and all of that. But then there's this this altar of incense is the next thing. And Revelation tells us that incense represent the prayers of the saints. It smells good to God when we pray to him. So become a person of prayer. There's something even deeper than that. The veil was torn and there's no longer one person that's able to go to God and go into God's presence one day a year. Spend time in his presence. 
and ponder it. So go past the wide world, past the outer court where we all gather, past all the ceremony and ritual, into the small, intimate, quiet place where it's just you and God. Because he says, now you're my temple. Now you're my tabernacle. And in that Holy of Holies that we talked about earlier, I'm running a little long, but you don't have anywhere to be. We talked about there are a few things in the Holy of Holies, right? When we're in that quiet, intimate place, it's just me and God. Remember, there was the manna, right? That it reminded Israel of God's provision and, his, and, and their ungratefulness. And so now, God, that, that I'm here, it's just me and you. You've been so good to me, and you've provided for me. And there's Aaron's rod. It reminded Israel of their rebellion against God's authority and I'm rebellious by nature, God. Help me to love what you love. Of course, we've got the tablets, right? The Ten Commandments. The covenant that reminded Israel of their failure to keep the law. And I, God, I haven't put you first. And I've been ignoring your voice. And finally, we look and there's the mercy seat. As God looked down and he saw the symbols of Israel's sin, right? Their rebellion and their failure. But he also saw the blood of the sacrifice covering it. And now, in this holy place, I know that you look down and you see the blood of Jesus covering my sin. And it's forgiven and it's forgotten. If you spend a little time doing that and then you step out into the courtyard and out into the world and you proclaim it with joy, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. Have you heard about my Jesus? Just see what will happen. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you this morning for giving us the time to Look into the truths that you've preserved for us through your word. Lord, we just ask that you would make my life, make our lives a holy place set apart for you. Help us to be reminded that our sins are forgiven and forgotten, that you provide for us, that you want something deeper for us and with us. Help us to live out that truth. Lord, we pray that you come and come quickly. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, ready? Break. Break. All right.